So here is our textbook. It's called Successful Qualitative Research, A Practical Guide by Braun and Clark. And in this video, I'll tell you how to use the textbook for our unit on PSYC 13015. The next question is... You're full of questions. Just before I talk about our prescribed text, I just want to give you a quick update on our teaching methods. I refer to forums on Moodle as our discussion forums. Well, our forum for qualitative methods will be called a qualitative Q&A forum. It's just the way Moodle works. You can have a discussion forum or a Q&A forum. Ours is gonna be the Q&A forum. So if I say discussion forum, don't get confused. Um, it's just the Q&A forum for qualitative. The reason why I keep thinking of it as a discussion forum is that it's a place for discussion. It's not just going to be a place where you ask questions and I answer the questions. What I want you to do is try answering your classmates' questions and maybe have a bit of discussion there, because that's the forum that's dedicated to qualitative. And there is a generic discussion forum for the unit that's for everything on the unit, but Darren and I won't be looking at that forum, so that's a place where you can discuss things with your classmates without your tutor poking their noses in. Okay. So back to the textbook. Now, this, this book first published in 2013. I don't think it's been updated since then, you know, like there being a second edition coming out. Um, if there is a second edition that comes out, just stick with this one. This, this will do us. This is actually better for us because you can get cheaper copies of this. You can buy second-hand copies of that. Did you know... Just a little secret here. Do you know um, that publishers like releasing new editions of textbooks as a way of screwing up the second-hand book market? And it, it's so that you can't sell your textbook to next year's students. You know, the publisher will release a new edition that next year's students will buy and they won't buy yours because yours is an old version. And that's the way that publishers make money. Um, you have to watch out for publishers. They can be a bit sneaky like that. You know, they're there to make profits for themselves. They're not looking after your interests, they're looking after their own. Anyway, that's a little bit of a side. Um, but I think the general point really is qualitative research isn't going to dramatically change in the next few years. This is going to require you to buy a new textbook. Now, the first sections of the book aren't actually set as prescribed. Why am I holding this up? You get it by now, don't you? The, the first two sections aren't actually prescribed reading for week one. Uh, the um, acknowledgements section and the section uh, called about the authors. You might be tempted just to skip those two sections, but don't skip them. Try and read them if you can, because they're important. Why are they important? They're important because in qualitative research, subjectivity is important. In other words, who we are and who we know impacts what we do. And the first thing you'll notice is that the book wasn't written by me. Now, why am I stating the obvious here? Well, because what I'm saying here is I would not have written the book in the way that Braun and Clark have written the book. Does that mean it's a bad book? No, no, it doesn't. I think it's a great book. So let me explain. I work in the same disciplinary space as Braun and Clark, which is critical psychology. But there the similarities kind of end. I'm involved in different types of projects, I have different life experiences, my cultural background is different, my gender is different, and so on. And all of that would lead me to write differently about qualitative methods. I agree with a lot of what Braun and Clark have written, but not all of it. In fact, I've written a qualitative methods book that's really quite different to this one. I actually co-wrote it with some colleagues in the UK uh, back in 2011. But don't go looking for that book because I want you to hear some different voices about Big Q qualitative methods. So the best way to use the textbook for our sessions is as a supplement to the other teaching modes we're using, the pre-recorded materials, our tutorials, and our Moodle forum. So in those other 
modes, I won't be regurgitating the text to you, and don't be surprised if I say something that's contradicted by the text. Now, because I may say some things that are contradicted by the textbook, you may wonder, well, who's right and who's wrong? You know, is the textbook right or is my tutor right? Well, that's an interesting question because it's wrong. It's interesting in its wrongness because that's a quantitative type question. That assumes that there's an objective singular truth on the matter rather than there being multiple truths. Does that sound a bit confusing? Well, we're going to look at that a bit more when I talk to you about ontology and epistemology, which is coming up fairly soon in, a, in, a, one of, in, in the next recording, one of the recordings that are coming in the week one. <laughs> yes, it's coming soon. Um, and I talk about it there. And it's important because we need to avoid that quantitative way of thinking that there's a singular truth. And you need to get your head around that when planning your interview, before you go into the interview. Think of it this way. Now, you're only interviewing one person for the assessment on our unit, but imagine that you were to interview two people and one said something that was contradicted by what the other said. Now, you wouldn't approach that by thinking your task is to figure out which participant was right and which was wrong. Maybe as a quantitative researcher, that would be what you would do, but as a qualitative researcher, you're not there to determine who's right and who's wrong, but to understand why each person said what they said. That's important because if you go into the interview with the frame of mind of trying to figure out when your participant is saying something truthful and when they're not, I'm smarter than you. It's going to be an interrogation. And I'm going to find out what I want to know. And I'm going to get it from you whether you like it or not. And, and that's not the interviewing style I want you to adopt for our assessment. That might be a really handy interviewing skill if you're working for ASIO or some other government intelligence agency, but it's not a handy interviewing skill for qualitative research. So you need to treat the textbook as a different voice and not to worry who's right and who's wrong. It's like polyvocal, we call it, hearing multiple voices. And that's important for qualitative research. And the textbook is going to provide you with a different perspective on some things. It's a book about big Q qualitative methods, so there'll be a lot of it that I'm in agreement with, but not all of it. And that's because we don't all agree on what qualitative methods are. The fact that there's so much disagreement is because qualitative research is as much an art as it is a science. And that's because subjectivity is front and center in big Q qualitative research. And you can explore these ideas more when you read the textbook. You'll find lots of material on that, particularly in chapters one and two. So the lesson really here is not to expect my audio and video recordings to align with the textbook. But, there's a but, there's a caveat here, and it's a big but. If I say something that's contradicted by the text and the thing I'm saying is in relation to our assessment task, particularly on how you're going to get graded for the task and what you need to do for the task, um, listen to me. <laughs> listen to me rather than the textbook. And that's because I'm the one who's written the marking rubric. So when the textbook tells you, as it does, that you should be using open-ended questions in your interview, you'll hear me saying that that doesn't really matter, that that's not a big issue. It doesn't matter really if you use open and closed questions. And listen to me on that one, because when you look at the marking criteria, you'll see my position reflected in the criteria. What you'll see is that there's absolutely no mention of open or closed questions in the criteria. And that reflects the fact that I don't think this stuff is important. So listen to me and look at the marking criteria because that's how your work's going to get judged. Now, oh, the marking criteria will be up on Moodle's site. That will be up there well ahead of time before you have to submit the assignment. So it should be in the first, yeah, first few weeks that will go up. Okay, now the other thing to say about the textbook is that we're not covering all of the textbook. We just don't have time. 
But that's where the book comes in really handy. If you find qualitative methods fits you, it works for you, it suits you, it interests you, then the book's going to give you all you need to get started as a qualitative researcher. My five sessions can't do that on their own because it's too short amount of time and we're only covering one method which is individual online interviews and one method of analysis which is thematic analysis. There's much much more to qualitative research than that. So that's where the book picks up on the slack for you. It gives you much more information on qualitative research that you you know after this unit you can go read the whole book and you can then away you go become a qualitative researcher just like me <laughs> don't make my don't make the same mistakes i have in my life but being a qualitative researcher isn't one of those mistakes okay so that's enough about our textbook crack on with it and I'll move on to my next recording where I'll talk you through the first few steps of planning that you'll need to do to become an effective Big Q qualitative interviewer on this unit. So till then, ta-da.